Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Fairdale this morning. We are glad to have you with us. We're excited to worship this morning. As you came in, I hope that you were greeted and given a bulletin. We've got all of our announcements here in the bulletin. So if you don't have one of those, you can get one in the back on your way out. But as you're getting situated and finding your seats, I want to encourage you to open your Bible to Psalm 33. Psalm 33 is going to be our call to worship this morning. And as you're finding that, I want to remind you that starting next Sunday begins our Answers in August series. So these are all the Sunday nights through the month of August. We're going to be looking at the age of the earth and talking about that. Also, this Wednesday evening, we are not going to have our normal services. We're going to have another family night. And so that is going to be this Wednesday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. right here at the church and out there in the, uh, in the yard and parking lot. Also, we have our 24 hours of prayer coming up here in August. This is going to be August the 20th and 21st. We've got a sign-up sheet downstairs outside the office. And so we want to encourage you all to figure out a time where you can come and you can pray and you can sign up to pray with some friends. Uh, and that would be a great time. So again, make sure you're looking at your bulletin so you see all the rest of the things that are going on. But let's look at Psalm 33 and let's let the words of Scripture lead our hearts for worship. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, and make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, and he puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope of salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him. Because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Father, we are thankful to be gathered for worship this morning. And we are thankful to read the words of Psalm 33, which tell us that the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And on those who hope in his steadfast love. God, we know that the promise is that you will deliver our souls from death. And keep us alive even through famine. God, we thank you for the wonderful promises that you've given to us in Scripture. God, we thank you that we have the promise that if we fear you, your eye is upon us. And God, as we worship you this morning, as we sing to you, and as we open the word and, and preach, may all of it be done out of praise and worship for King Jesus. And it's in his name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? It is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom. Shed for us his precious blood. And 
Would you return to your seats as we continue in song?
Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, and I'll begin reading in verse 12. Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow their greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for your wisdom in uh, creating your church, Father, creating your body. And God, we thank you that you have made us a part of it. And God, we thank you, even as your word says, that we are just a part of it and not the whole ourselves. And God, I pray that you would protect us from that type of thinking. God, I pray that none of us here would ever begin to think anything along the lines of, I don't need other members of the church. I don't need other parts of the body. Father, I pray that none of us would, would, would begin thinking along the lines of I'm more important or a more necessary or a better part of the body than, than someone else. God, I pray you would help us to rely on, on one another. God, I thank you for that. Again, I thank you for your wisdom in, in creating your church that way. And that you've taught us to rely on, on you on our Savior, 
And God, that we must rely on, on one another. I pray you'd help us to be good members of the body, God, good parts of the body, doing our part, using the gifts that you've given us for the benefit of, of the whole. And God, as we each do our part, I pray that you would use our body, use, use this church, God, to accomplish your mission. That Christ might be honored, that the gospel might be upheld, and Father, that, that you might be worshipped here among us, but also through you using us uh, among our neighborhood and our community and, and even the world. And God, we thank you so much for Jesus, who is the, the glue of our body, the, 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 common, the common trust and belief that holds us all together. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing? Grace, grace, God.
seated. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your grace, your marvelous grace that saves us, Father. It's so good to be here today on a Sunday with other believers, worshiping and singing praises to you. And Father, for those that are visiting that maybe don't know about your grace, we ask that today is the day they receive it. Father, as we prepare to take up this tithe and offerings, the blessings that you've given us, help us to give back to the community and to the world around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, for our pastoral prayer time, I don't know if you are aware of it or not, but we have our children's ministries at camp right now. They actually left on Friday, and they're coming back tomorrow. So we want to pray for them. We want to pray for the children, obviously, who went, for the leaders who are there with them, and also for the families of the children who went. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you again as we have come to this point in the service that we are turning our attention now to the young people in our midst. And God, we think about the e-kids who are at camp currently. God, perhaps they're doing Bible studies this morning or hearing uh, the Bible taught this morning in a large group setting, or perhaps they're uh, meeting with uh, their own uh, group, or our own churches together. We don't know what exactly they're doing right now. But God, we are so thankful for Crossings and Crossings Ministry and the blessing that it has been to our church as we have taken youth groups there and we've taken children's camps there. And God, we are praying that you would use this time, these couple days away of, of children's camp to really reach these young students, that these kids would be hearing the truth of the Bible, that they would be receiving the truth and that they would be hearing it and that they would be believing it. God, we pray that you would be at work in their hearts, drawing them to yourself. That those students who perhaps have not made a profession of faith, that they would. That they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. God, we want to pray for those students who perhaps already have made a profession of faith. That they would continue to grow in their faith. That they would be uh, a more, uh, that their faith would be stronger as a result of being at this camp. God, we want to pray for the leaders. God, we think of Matt and Liz as they uh, do so well to lead the E-Kids ministry, and they have a group of volunteers with them. And God, I believe there are five adult volunteers there this week. And God, we thank you for their willingness to go and to serve these children, to be a chaperone, to give up their, their time away from work or their time away from their family uh, to serve these kids and to be a blessing to them. So, God, we pray for them, that they would continue to be a good, godly influence for these children, that they would be pointing them to Christ just as much as, as the speaker this week is pointing them to Christ. God, we want to pray for the families who have children at camp right now. God, I'm sure for some of them it's difficult to see their children leave and them not to go with them. God, I pray that they would be comforted. Uh, knowing that Matt has a great team of volunteers that are going to take very good care of the children. 
God, I pray that this, this would be a blessing for them, knowing that Crossings is doing so much to make this happen and to make this possible, uh, that they would feel uh, loved by Crossings by the way that they are serving their children this summer. God, I pray that this would serve to strengthen our church as a whole. God, we have talked for years and years about the importance of, of investing in a younger generation. And so, God, I pray that these young people, as they continue to grow, as they continue to mature, that they would be uh, just trusting Jesus solid in their faith and that they would be the next leaders here at First Baptist Fairdale. God, perhaps one of these young children at Fairdale or at camp this morning would be a future pastor here at our church. God, perhaps one of these young children at camp this morning will be a, a missionary someday. and They will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And God, we pray that you would help us as a church to prioritize children, to love them, and to love them well. And God, may we trust you with the results. And God, as we turn our focus now to the preaching of the word, as Pastor Josh is about to come and preach to us, God, I pray that you'd free our minds of distraction and help us to truly focus on what the Bible says about what a, health, what a healthy church is. God, help us to learn this morning. God, help us to see Jesus, our great Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn the Bible to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. We are in between book studies here on Sunday mornings as we spent several weeks recently in Job, and in between, we are looking at the Bible for an emphasis on healthy church. Last week, we looked at that from the book of Titus, and today we will look at this from the book of Ephesians. We'll be back in a book soon as we walk through books. Here's what we typically do. But for now, we are doing this. So if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I did this morning want to recognize some people really, really quickly. Uh, and y'all could just stand up right there where you're at so we can greet you all. Uh, Chris and Laura DeWeese and their children, William and Hannah. If you would stand up. Church, if y'all would welcome them, please. Chris and Laura served in this church from 2003 to 2009. Six years that they were here, uh, served faithfully. They were an awesome part. They, they taught, they served, they worked, they taught classes. They did all sorts of things. Uh, Chris is now on staff at a church in South Carolina, and they are just up on vacation and wanted to come back to see us, right? Uh, that was 12 years ago, and so many of you all have come here since then. You may not remember Chris and Laura DeWeese, uh, but I assure you that they are brothers and sisters in Christ and faithful to the work of God. And thank you all for coming, even on vacation, wanting to come and visit us. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Ephesians chapter four is gonna help us look at healthy church. You know, my wife is away at camp as a chaperone and I'm trying to be dad and Mr. Mom all weekend. And we've had nuggets and pizza and Everything like that has been all of our meals. But it's fun being a dad and, you know, if we can allow our minds to stop being so distracted, the parenting life can be quite enjoyable. We've been swimming and we've played ball and we've had a good time together. And last night we were playing the, the matching game. You know the game where you lay out all the cards on the floor and you just flip them over to find a match? Such a fun game, simplest game in the world, but it's so good. But I gotta admit to you all, as trying as hard as I could possibly try with my best concentration, which albeit is not very good, with the best concentration, I cannot beat kids at the matching game. Kids are so good at this game, being able to do that. And if you've ever done that, with you, I hope you feel the same way, but it's fun to get into stuff like that. Another thing that we really enjoy is doing a puzzle. I hope you like puzzles. 
Many people think they're boring or they take too long or whatever, but that's the point of it. That's what's fun, right? It takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort, and you have to sit there and work. And the, the, the smaller the pieces and the more the pieces, the more fun and challenging it is. I hope you will try doing a puzzle. But sometimes when you do a puzzle, you get to the very end of this thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle that took you days to do. You get to the very, very end and you're missing a couple pieces. 998 pieces are there and it looks fantastic except for that little dot that's like the size of a penny. And that happens sometimes. And there's a weird feeling at that moment, isn't it? We did all of this for nothing. It feels undone, it feels not right, not complete, not the, not the way it should be. You might even say we can't even celebrate this. There's no closure here. It's not working the way it's supposed to or we can't move on to the next one. We can't tear it apart, we can't start over. We, what do we do here? And in that same way, I want you to think about church. That when there are pieces or parts albeit very, very tiny, that are missing or not in the right place, then the church is not healthy. The Bible teaches us how we are to understand and think about church. Last week, we looked at five observations from the book of Titus. Here's what they were. Number one, God has order for his churches. Remember in verse five of chapter one, he told Titus, put what remains into order. He used the very word. Number two, God raises up the leaders for churches. And after a week of preaching that and all the feedback that we've been getting, I realize that is perhaps the most challenging to you all. Does he really raise up leaders for churches? Number two was God raises up the leaders. Number three, those leaders, pastors, elders, overseers, whatever the Bible calls them, elders are Bible teachers identified by their character more than their giftedness. We recognize a called by God leader by their character, not by how good they are at it. Number four, the power is in the message not the messenger. The power of God is in the message, not the messenger. And number five, teaching and training is the strategy. Teaching and training is the strategy. That was from Titus. That was very helpful. It's got you all thinking, I know, in a lot of ways. It's got you thinking about all of your church experiences, and that's good. That's what we want to do. We want to see, right, if we are living out what the Bible says or even trying or getting close to it. We want to be able to identify pitfalls in our lives and in our church lives, in our relationships that are just not of God and that are maybe more worldly or or man-centered or pragmatic, meaning, hey, this really works. If we do this, people will show up or things like that. That's not what God wants us to be. And so that was five observations from Titus, and this morning we're going to do four observations from Ephesians. Look with me at Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna start reading in verse seven. Ephesians four, we're gonna start reading in verse seven, seven through 16. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children 
tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's a good passage, isn't it? That's one of those passages, and preachers like to say this a lot, that's one of those passages that seems to preach itself, isn't it? Just reading those verses, and if we wanted to, we could just read that about five different times here this morning, and it would start to like sink into you, and it would like start to come through your skin, and through your ears, and, and through your brain, and you'd be like, wow, that's really, really good. It is. The book of Ephesians is an interesting book. It's six chapters, and it covers so very much. It's got this weird divide in it where the first three chapters are really heavy on, on doctrine, theology, if you will, the first three chapters. Ephesians is loaded. It gets into all sorts of things. It discusses predestination, right? It discusses very clearly the plan of salvation, that we are dead in our sins, that we cannot save ourselves, that we must trust in Christ for salvation, that nobody is good enough, right? It, it talks about this. But then at the end of chapter three, there's a major shift in Ephesians. And the last three chapters, four, five, and six, are very, very practical. Chapter four that we just read here today is simply about church and how is church supposed to be and how does it work and what's the goal of it, right? And then you get into chapter five and it's all about family. You hear a lot about family. It addresses wives, it addresses husbands. It is in Ephesians chapter five where we have the biggest and best New Testament statement on what marriage is that marriage is to be a loving commitment that reflects Christ and the church. That is profound, and the Bible even says here that that is profound. In chapter six, we have the armor of God, and that the devil has a plan and is attacking. The devil wants to ruin your life. He wants to destroy your soul. He wants so badly to get you to doubt and question and not believe God. He wants you to be okay with sin. He wants you to call evil a good thing and good evil. He wants you to be distracted and to be confused and he wants you to not know and be certain. So the Bible here in Ephesians warns us to be on guard, to be defensive spiritually with what the devil is trying to do that we would be focused on God. This is just a very brief overview, and Ephesians is loaded, as you can tell. So after the first three chapters, heavy on doctrine, what we believe, we get to chapter four where we are today, and it starts to emphasize the body of Christ, unity in the body of Christ. So this is a great place, like many New Testament letters, this is a great place for us to see church help. Today, we have four observations right here. Surely, there are many, many more in Ephesians, but we're just looking here at this chunk of chapter four. Number one, please take notes. Number one, every believer contributes to the work of the church. It's fundamental, it's basic, every Believer contributes to the work of the church. Look at verse one. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, an individual, you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. All right, there is calling, there is purpose in the life of the believer. We know that. We can look at many passages in the Bible to know there's calling and purpose there. But now, jump over to verse seven. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. The Bible teaches us that in order for somebody to be a Christian, and therefore be the church, they must have come to a place where they are trusting in Christ for salvation, 
We cannot just think that we're Christian. We cannot just start attending church. We must have come to the point where we believe that we have sinned against God and that God has sent Jesus in love to be our Savior, to be the answer to life. And so we turn to him. We turn away from our sins and we turn to Christ and say, I want to be saved. I want to get right with God. I want to become a Christian. And in doing that, God then and only then makes us a child of God. It is not true that everybody is a child of God. The Bible says that those who come to him in faith, those who believe in him, they become children of God. When somebody becomes a believer, puts their faith in Christ, gets saved, and is a child of God, then we see what this Bible is teaching here. This is my first point. God makes that person a contributor to the work of the church. That person then finds its true significance in doing what God wants them to do. And the way he does that is not only by changing their lives, but he does that by gifting them. He does that by giving them the Spirit. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of believers, and as the Holy Spirit is living inside of believers, they now have a gracious gift from God. And what I'm showing you right here is that every single believer does. We are not talking about natural gifts. If you're tall and you're great at getting stuff off the top shelf, then that is a gift, right? And your family appreciates your height. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a spiritual gift that God gives to somebody once they have come to faith in Christ. The gift can be used for many things, but it certainly is used to build up the body of Christ. It is used to point people to Christ. It is used in the emphasis of Christ. And every single believer contributes to the work of Christ. This is extremely important. This is what it means. In the kingdom of God, in the church, every piece matters. You know what you know what happens in sports sometimes? You know what happens in sports sometimes? If you've got some good pieces, it doesn't really matter what the other pieces are, isn't that right? I heard a story this week where Michael Jordan came into a gym and he had gotten a little bit older and they were making fun of him and the guy was putting down Michael Jordan and he couldn't do it anymore. And Michael Jordan right there on the spot told that guy, you find the four worst players in this gym, the four worst players in this gym, and you put them on my team, and we're gonna play right here with everybody watching. I heard what you just said. And right there with everybody watching, the best player with the four worst players beat all the other players. The truth is, in sports, that can happen sometimes, can it? Doesn't always work, but sometimes it can. That is so far. That is so far away from what God is talking about with church. Sometimes we say team Jesus, right? Or sometimes we say, you know, church is a team. And I love to say that teamwork makes the dream work when we're all working together, right? And there's strength in numbers and stuff like that. That does not mean that we are like a team. We're a church. Every piece matters. I can't tell you how many times I have found myself in a spot where I had to do what, what my position called me to do. And I felt extremely, extremely inadequate, unequipped, not able to. And in that moment, I would get a call, a text from multiple people saying, we're gonna pray for you right now. The Bible teaches us that God doesn't do anything based off the skill of the individual, no matter how skilled they are. The Bible teaches us that God does what he does the way he wants to do it. That's when every piece is contributing. Every piece matters in the church. Every believer contributes. There are no tryouts, there are no cuts. There's no such thing as a believer who is not a good fit. There's no such thing as a believer who doesn't have anything to offer or contribute. This is not the way we think about it. And here's why this is really, really important, because I know that many of you all feel that way. 
I know that sometimes we buy into this worldly thinking and we think, man, they're, they're really good at it. And you think, man, I'm just not really good at it. It's not right. And this is why this is important for you to understand here today. And that's why we're preaching these messages that are so like not the norm because we want to be healthy in the way we understand God and his church. God has made it this way on purpose. He has intentionally designed it where every single piece matters and every believer contributes. It's too easy to just find some home run hitters and say, we're gonna score a lot of runs. Hey, you take a walk, you get hit by a pitch, hey, you get you a little single and make an error, you get on base and I'll hit you in. That's not church. Church is that every single person that trusts in Christ through faith matters to what's going on here. And there is no way for us biblically and for Christ-honoring way to ignore that. Here's what I mean. The goal of church is to magnify Christ. The goal of church is to hold Jesus up high so that the people can see him. It is to be a light in the darkness. It is to be a source of good. I don't ever want people to think that we're good. We don't even feel that we're good. It's to be a source of the goodness of God in the midst of so much lack of goodness. That's what it's supposed to be. The church is to magnify Christ. Christianity is not, first and foremost, a help system for us. I know that practically and functionally, Christianity in turn is very good for us, right? But it is not, first and foremost, that. This is why so often, and I don't want to step on toes, and I, I don't want to go down the wrong direction. This is why so often, the parenting strategy of just getting your kids to church does not work. This is why so often that will backfire and it'll be more of a mess later on than you had even started with. It is not just a help system for us. Church is about God from beginning to the end. It is about us representing God, communicating God, displaying God. It is about us being faithful in all the ways that God is faithful so that people might consider God, so they might hear about him rightly, so that we would not be a roadblock, so that we wouldn't be a hazard, so that we wouldn't be a hindrance to people, but so that people would, in plain daylight, with eyes and ears and hearts and mind, would say, maybe God is real. Maybe he is a father in heaven. Maybe he is there. Maybe he is the very help that I need. Maybe he can forgive me of my sins that I feel such guilt over and conviction over. Maybe he really is a life changer. Maybe he really is the source that I'm looking for. Maybe he is the peace that my life needs. That's what church is to be. It's about God. And this is why by faith, Churches must be God-centered more than me-centered or self-centered or, hey, whatever works. If this is only about God making me and my life better, and you know that so often people are only involved with church for themselves to make their lives better, and it sounds good when we're getting started, Every single one of us know people who, for whatever reason, things are not going well, and we say something like, well, maybe you should come to church with me. And that kind of hints toward, if you start coming to church with me, your life might start falling in line or getting better. Or I've got a job, maybe you'll find a job, or something like that. Or I've got a happy family, you come to church with me, you'll have a happy family, right? And I'm saying, that is not it. That may be some of the trickle-down effect from the goodness of God and focusing on him, but that is not the goal of church. It is not. We must know the difference. Here's what I'm saying. If it's only about God making me and my life better, then I can focus on God and not need the church. I can come and see if it starts working out, and if it doesn't, then I'm not gonna deal with it, and if it does, he's made me better, and I don't need it anymore. Therefore, the church is not important there. And the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't. The Bible continues and continues and continues to emphasize the importance of church. And so often, people are taught to go to church for themselves' sake to make their own lives better. And there's this gigantic disconnect there. It's not right. If we are reading the Bible, we are seeing that he continues over and over and over again to emphasize the importance of church. Here's what it says. If this is about Jesus and drawing people to him, 
then I must understand that I need church. I need church, the church needs me. I need to be the church. I need to be the peace that God has made me to be so the church can be what the church needs to be. If we deduce church to, well man, if you go there and meet such and such, they can really help you out, then we've become nothing better than a help system. That's all we've become. And there's all sorts of help systems out there. We get calls every single week for people that need help. I get calls every week for people that need help with parenting. I get calls every week for people that need food. I get calls every single week for people that need jobs. And guess what? We're a good resource for that. This week alone, I helped people with every single one of those. We help people with every single one of those. But there are lots of other sources out there that do the same thing. We are that, but we are not first that. First and foremost, we are a city on top of a hill that shines bright that everybody sees. First and foremost, we are an embassy of heaven, if you will, the kingdom of heaven. We are a people that are focused on Jesus to know us, to deal with us, to see us, observe us, to be around us, is to see that Jesus is the driving factor. And every piece contributes to that. When it turns into what are you good at or what are you not good at, it is not Christ-centered. We must recognize this. If this is about Jesus drawing people to him, then we understand that we need the church because impressive lives and awesome people don't change lives. God changes lives. And God does that through faithfulness to his faithfulness. God changes lives through faithfulness to his truth, through faithfulness to his son, Jesus, our savior. People being faithful to God and his ways. In that way, we can see why God keeps emphasizing the church. And we can see, listen to me, listen to me. In the history of, of the church, let's just say the last 50 years, there has been an incredible emphasis on all-star church people. And there has been very little emphasis on every single person in the church matters. And right now, where we all know a lot of amazing all-star church people, By and large, we would say, the church is less healthy or seemingly less healthy or more distracted or distraught or frustrated. When the Bible's emphasis is on every single individual in the church. I'm not saying every person. I'm saying every believer Now, it's another conversation that we're not gonna take the time for today, but in saying that every piece matters, the New Testament then wants us to quickly identify how do I fit in, what do I do? Am I a prayer, am I a giver, am I a goer, am I a worker, am I an encourager, am am I a preacher, am I a teacher, What, what do I do, am I a lover? And there's all these different ways that you can contribute. And what breaks my heart is that we do often hear people say, man, I ain't got anything to give. When God's gifts are not these all-star characteristics that we're looking for. God's gifts are, can you love? Can you help? Can you serve? Those are the gifts that God gives out. Everybody can do that. Everybody. We need to recover in a healthy church that every single piece, every believer matters. Number one, every believer contributes to the work of the church. And in the passage that we read earlier from 1 Corinthians 12, a different letter in the New Testament, you hear him saying, it's like the body, the eye to the hand to the foot, right? You see what I'm saying? And every single piece or part mattered. Number two, as God gifts every believer contributing to the work of the church, number two, God gives some believers to be leaders. This is what we recognize. There are people in our midst that we think, 
They're a leader. They've got more gifting. They want to do more things. They want to get people together. They want to teach. They want to disciple. They want to preach. They want to go. They want to make things happen. They have a heart for people. They have a heart for soul. They have a heart for salvation, right? They have a heart for these things. And you recognize this in people. Look at your Bible. Verse 11, talking about Christ. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. In one verse, we have the Bible telling us, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, writing to the Ephesians, God gave that. Verse 7 says, he gave every believer a gift, a gracious gift to every believer. But verse 11 says, and he gave all these leaders. The apostles, we know what those are. The prophets, we know what those are. The evangelists, we know what those are. The shepherds and teachers. Now, throughout history, there's been a lot of discussion on if this shepherds and teachers is two different things. Are there shepherds and teachers? But I think not. This is a shepherd teacher. The word is linked there. If you get back and study it, it's a shepherd teacher. It's the same role. This is a, this is a pastor. This is a leader pastor that also teaches the Bible and the qualifications for a pastor. They must be a Bible teacher. We talked about that last week, and yet you see that here. But verse 11 makes obvious he gives them. It's so important for us to understand. I told you last week from Titus that God raises up the leaders. Here we have it saying God gives them. God gives them to the church. We must believe this. We must take God at his word. We must believe that God provides that. Now, after last week's message, we had a little bit of pushback saying, hey, it sounds good, and I, I guess when a church is healthy, you can say that God is raising up people through it and producing leaders, but it doesn't happen all the time. To which I said, well, if you're saying a church is not healthy, then maybe it takes a long time for it to get healthy, right? What I'm saying is, we should take God at his word, strive for church health, and believe that God will produce leaders there. In Ephesians chapter four, it says, God gave the leaders to the church. Now, I think sometimes we have to say out of nowhere, God just brought one and they showed up. But I think that's not even the norm. I think that's more the exception. I think in the midst of a Bible, faithful, loving, serving, committed church that is aiming towards church health, God will give those leaders there. It says he gave them. Now, you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah way back and God told Abraham he's gonna give him a son? Remember that way back, Genesis 11 or something like that? Genesis 12. And you remember Abraham going, well, we don't have any kids and we can't have any kids and my wife's never been able to have any kids so I don't think it's gonna happen. And you remember Abraham not waiting and so he went and had a baby somewhere else and God came back and said, no, I, I told you I was gonna give you a child with your wife. You went and got you a child somewhere else but I told you I was gonna give you one The Bible says here that God is going to give you leaders. If we will wait on him and obey what he says to do and take him at his word, we believe that God will give us leaders. It may take longer than we initially had thought. I heard somebody say this past week that, well, I've been at my church three years and I don't see any leaders. And my thought was, Okay, but what if you take five more years and you pray your eyes out and you preach the word every single service, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, in your office when anybody will show up and you be about the word and about the word and about the word and you make sure the people know what God says and know what God says and they start growing in the word. And you're praying like crazy, day in and day out, 52 weeks a year, 365 days a year. You are begging God to make his church healthy. You do that for five more years. You think God won't produce a leader? You see what I'm saying? 
can imagine that anybody would say, I don't think so. The Bible says here, he gave to the church the leaders. Number three, the leader's work is to equip the believers to work. Now, if y'all were gonna get upset today, this would be the point. The leader's work is to equip the believers to work. The Bible does not say that the leaders do all the work. And if you've ever been a part of an organization anywhere, if a few people are supposed to be doing all the work, then it's not very healthy, right? And you get frustrated and angry and bad attitudes, right? And the different pieces that aren't the leaders start to think that they're not that important, right? And they're not gonna miss me. It doesn't matter if I'm there. That's so far away from being biblical. Look back in your Bible. Look at verse 12. Verse 11 says he gave those leaders, but verse 12 says he gave them to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's why he gave them, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We all need to see that this is what God's word says. You need to know Ephesians 4, 12. Read it with our own eyes. As we grow in our faith, as the months and years go by, we should be thinking, you should be thinking, and you should be able to say, and you should be saying. My church taught me that. My leaders taught me that. My pastors taught me that. In being in a healthy church, you should be naturally, with fluid, with normalcy, seeing yourself being equipped. I, I, didn't, I didn't used to know how to pray, but I've been around a praying church and I've been in so many prayer circles and meetings and groups that, that I pray now. I didn't used to pray with my family, but I pray now. Hey, I didn't used to try to be gracious with my money. I didn't used to save money so that I could be a blessing, but I've been around that so many times. I've come to see it lived out that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I found the joy in biblical stewardship that now it's just taken a part of my life. I used to get angry at everything, man. I used to be so hot-headed, and boy, I would blow up on somebody in a second. You crossed me for a second, but you know what? Been around church for a while, and I keep being reminded that the Bible says be slow to anger and get over myself, and it ain't worth it and doesn't solve anything. And man, I ain't that hot-headed fool that I used to be. Jesus is working in me. The Bible says that through the leader's work, the believers are equipped to work. As time goes on, we feel that God is growing us through being involved. This is natural but it's also supernatural because God is doing it. The leader's work is to equip the believers to work. Does everybody see that there in verse 12? Now, a lot of times we can talk about ministry and church work and church life and church health through this idea of multiplication Here's what I mean. If, if it's expected for just one of our pastors to call every church member, right? Then at a very, 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 very strict rate, right? Of multiple, multiple phone calls a week, they might, might hit everybody once a year. but very simply and smoothly with lots of people checking up on lots of people <laughs> happens every week. Happens every week. There's a huge fundamental difference in understanding who does the work. What makes a church healthy? It's when everybody works. It's when every piece matters. 
Was it important this morning that a certain individual show up here to pray for you? No. Was it important this morning that some individual pray for you? Yes. You see the difference? I have not prayed for every one of you all by name this morning. But I've prayed for several of you all by name this morning. But I would bet and I hope that somebody has prayed for you this morning. You see the difference? The Bible says that we leaders equip the believers to work. The leader's work is to help you learn to work for the kingdom of God for the witness to Christ. Number three, the leader's work is to equip the believers to work. And now finally, number four, all of this working together creates a healthy church. Now look at the rest of our passage. We're now at verse 13. It's pretty clear how, starting at verse seven, grace was given to everybody through a gift. Everybody has a gift. Verse 11, he gave the leaders Verse 12, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. But now, look what happens at the second half of verse 12. And this is almost like heavy. It is over the top. It is very redundant. It is a repeating of itself in different words just for emphasis. Look at the end of verse 12. For building up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, but rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. According to the Bible, according to this letter to the church in Ephesians, what makes the body grow? Look back at verse 16. According to the Bible, To Ephesians chapter four in verse 16, what makes the body grow? Each part working properly. Does everybody see that? This is critical. It's critical in your thinking for church. It's critical in your thinking for why you're here. It's critical in your thinking for what will make us healthy. Now, do pastors matter? Of course they do. Look what it says, verse 16, from the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. So we see the significance of the pastor, shepherd, teaching, training, loving, supporting, encouraging, building up, equipping the believers to work so that then it works properly. When this happens, when you believe that you matter in the kingdom of God, you, your little self, your little insignificant self matters. When you believe that you matter, not because you're good at what you do. That's the worldly way of thinking. We're not some organization out here. When you believe that you matter because you love Jesus and Jesus has placed you in the church and given you a purpose, then we're on our way to church health. When we're thinking like, I don't matter, I don't really contribute, I don't really make a difference, I don't really give that much money, or you know, I don't have anything to offer, no, no. But when you're thinking, God saved me, set my eyes upon Jesus, put me in this body of Christ, and therefore I matter, because the Bible says every piece matters, because that's what it takes to be working properly, then we're moving toward church health. 
And the flip side of that, let's just be honest, the flip side of that is to the degree that you're not thinking that way, we're not very healthy. It's just the truth. There's the pain of being a church leader. To the degree that we've not helped you think that way, to the degree that we have not taught you that, we're not very healthy. Now, here's the key though. There's a word that pops up here several times, okay? And it is the word unity. You've seen it, right? You've seen the word unity in this passage. But I want to end here with a heavy emphasis on Jesus. Because in the world that we live in, unity is one of those hot words that we love to say, but we don't know how to make it, right? Can't we all just get along sounds awesome, but it doesn't help us get along. Next time you're at a little tentious moment, family, get together in the workplace, scream out, can't we all just get along and watch everybody head back to their own room. It doesn't create unity. If you've ever been a part of any organization, you have recognized what we've said many times. It's so much easier to identify problems than it is solutions. Anybody with two eyes can recognize the problems. Anybody can do that. Anybody can say, well, that's a mess. But solving it is a much bigger issue. But God has given us a big book to direct us, to lead us in paths of righteousness. He has. And I want to show you where unity comes from. Look back up at verse one. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, verse two, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain, see the word there, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now let's stop right there for just a second. Those are good terms that sound like they create unity, right? Sounds like they create unity. Gentleness and humility and bearing with one another, and those are, listen, those are applications that flow out of unity. Don't miss that. You cannot just say, hey, I'm real gentle and I'm real humble and we're gonna have unity here. No, y'all, our world is suffering far and wide. Our nation is suffering, our homes are suffering, the world is suffering because we don't know what unites. That's just the truth. God unites. Look here, look at verse four. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Do you see how much doctrine there is there? In Ephesians chapter four, coming right out of chapter three, Paul goes all in on here is the single post. There aren't posts everywhere. There aren't stakes everywhere. One, 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 one. We are united in what we believe. We are united in the God that reigns over us. We are united in that every one of us are a sinner, wicked in our hearts, lost before God, dead in our sins, unable to save ourselves, unable to worship God until we come to know God's love for us through Christ. One, one, one. Divisions come when we start to see all the different things that are messing us up. Unity comes when we see the one thing that we have in common, faith in Christ who came from God according to this word and gave us life. Don't miss where unity comes from. As long as we keep saying that unity will come when we are trying hard to be humble and gentle, we're not gonna be united. But when our faith in Christ, according to this book, based off all of the things that he's teaching us, is what's driving us then flow things like humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another because we're focused on God. And once we are finally focused on God, we have a church where every piece matters. If you're focused on you, you'll continue to say, I don't really matter that much. 
If you're focused on God, you will see how incredibly important you are for the health of the church. We cannot miss that the church is the body of Christ. May you today center your life on him. May you repent of your sins, trust in Christ, and be encouraged as we move toward church health. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for observations of church health from the book of Ephesians. We thank you, God, for the emphasis upon unity in chapter four. And we thank you, God, that every piece matters. Oh, Father, we pray here today that you would work in our church. God, in a day where so many people are burnt out or put out, we apologize for that. We hate to see people hurting. We hate when we've become prideful. And we pray, God, that you would give us a spirit of gentleness and patience and humility. But Father, we know that it must be through faith in Christ. God, set our eyes on the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Father, we ask your blessing on us, your spirit to drive us. We thank you for your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you're ready to trust in Christ, that the things that we've talked about today have been far from your mindset on not only yourself, but also on church. If you're here today and you're ready to get yourself focused on Christ, we would love to help you do that. Even as we sing this last song, come let me know that you are ready to trust in Christ and set your life on him. If you're here today and you've never been baptized and you need to be baptized and you want us to help you move toward baptism, we will help you with that. If you're here today and you want this to be your church home, you want us to be your church family, you want to be a piece of helping us move toward church health, then you can come let us know. Please understand, according to the Bible, every believer matters for church health. As we sing, let's respond.
Yeah, you can clap. Uh, I got one real quick announcement as, as we leave. If you were in Sunday school, you may have heard this already, but if not, then maybe not. Uh, the Laymans, Marcus and Rachel Layman, the missionaries that we support that are members of our church working with, uh, with Wycliffe Bible Translators, they have a date now when they're leaving for France for language school. They will be leaving on August the 18th, okay? And so part of getting ready to leave on August 18th, they have a few things they need to get uh, to get. They've asked for some raincoats, some rain boots. I think the kids have asked for a coloring book and, and some neosporin, di different things like that. And, uh, and what they've done is they have created a wish list on Amazon where you can go on Amazon, you can look at the list they have, you can choose anything that, that you might want to get for them, and then it comes up, their address comes up, and you can have it mailed to their address, okay? Um, so there's, we have some flyers like this. You may find some of these in some of the Sunday school classes. There one, there's uh, three or four down in the basement, I know. Um, and there's a, there's a QR code on it where you can take a picture of that code. It'll send you to their Amazon wish list, right? Easy as can be, you can do that. Um, if you don't know how to do that, or uh, if you have other questions, then feel free to talk to Chris Herod, um, our missions director, and he can set you up. Uh, you can either uh, talk to him in person, he's here today, or you can uh, text him or call him and talk to him on the phone, and he will be happy to help you um, get connected to where you can, you can look at some of those needs and, and, and maybe fulfill some of those if you want to. All right? Um, and also, in the meantime, obviously, we need to be praying for the, for the laymans as they're getting ready to, for this move and starting... Uh, or continuing language school in person there in France and getting ready to, um, to move on to Africa. Uh, as we close our service today, uh, I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Amen.